Coming to you from the HagmanReport.com studio. Located in the Keystone State. Birthplace of a mighty nation. It's your host, Doug Hagman. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening and good afternoon, wherever you are in whatever time zone. Today, Pastor David Langford and I, Steve Quayle, will be sitting in for uh, Doug Hagman, and we're just blessed and privileged to be able to take some of the uh, weight off his shoulders during this very um, that troubling time at the loss of his son, Joe Hagman. And what David and I are going to do today is we'll just play, and by the way, we haven't talked about what we're going to talk about, but ladies and gentlemen, we are in a time where the building up of the faith of the saints is at an all-time low. As Pastor Langford and I go on the, the radio today together, we're seeing a total turning away from all that's good, and I'm not talking uh, everyone, but the majority of people, even the, that now the uh, more uh, evangelical Christians are supporting gay marriage than, than, than ever before, and it's doubling. So we're talking about men departing from the faith. We're talking about the things that are happening and the unfortunate and untimely death of Joe Hagman is indicative of the evil that's out there. And the devil goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And and this is really important. So today, Pastor Langford and I are going to talk about the things that that we can do and that we should be aware of that they'll be not, uh, uh, you know, we we need to be aware of the wiles of the uh, the devil. So David, go ahead and just share your heart as you see what's kind of happened, you know, through this tragedy, but also it's brought people, I think Doug's up to probably, I don't know, close to 20,000 people that genuinely love him, that have, you know, sent supporting emails or or uh, posting on his YouTube posts and stuff, and that's pretty heartwarming because, ladies and gentlemen, whether you believe it or not, if you love Jesus, you're bought with the blood of a lamb, you're looking forward to his second coming, then this platform that Doug Hagman has provided has been a calling from God in his life, and for all of us, it's kind of like our fellowship, and this is where we, you know, get together to not only learn what's going on in the world, and by the way, you've learned more, I would guess this, you've learned more about the Word of God from Pastor Langford's appearance on this show than any pulpit in America. Now, uh, that may be a broad statement, maybe even a statement, not to brag, but where else will you go? So it's imperative that we keep Doug on the air, and I can just tell you this, thank each and every one of you that has, you know, supported him, because again, the the big, uh, how do I say this, David, the big lie that the American, let's say, professing Christians uh, seem not to understand is, number one, the lateness of the hour, and they're not to, you know, uh, muzzle the ox that treads out the grain. Go ahead and take it, David. Okay, thank you, Steve. It's such a joy to be with you today as well and to share uh, from the Scriptures. But before I get into the Scriptures, I have had so many people uh, want to send their condolences uh, to Doug and Renee, Eric, Jackie, Laura, through our ministry. And I had a lady from uh, Australia. Uh, I hope I pronounced her first name correctly, Reina, R-E-I-N-A. Uh, her email sums up uh, people's grief and condolences. And I just want to read that email today before we get started, because, you know, for many years now, both Doug and Joe have said I was their pastor and um, I just feel a responsibility in ministering uh, during this time of grief, during this time of bereavement. But this dear lady says, I'm writing to you because you are truly my pastor. I look forward to your sermons on the Hagman Report every week, and my soul is enriched with every one of your sermons. Pastor David, I'm so devastated by the loss of Joe Hagman. I have been crying ever since I heard the news. I'm crying as I write this email to you. Although I never met Joe, I loved him like a brother. I look forward to listening to him every night, and I did so nearly every night for many years. He really was like a brother. I laughed at his clever wit. I was awed by his deep insights, and I witnessed and admired his growth over his years on the Hagman program. I never met him, but I loved him. I am deeply devastated by his passing. The world has lost a beautiful light. I never saw the trials he was facing. All I experienced was an incredible young man 
who had the courage to not only face the evil forces of this world, but to stand in the front line of the battle against them. Joe was a hero to me. He will always be a hero and an inspiration to me. I'm going to miss him so much. The world is a lesser place without him. I cannot even imagine the pain his family is going through. I can't even begin to imagine it. So many broken hearts, as Joe was loved so deeply. I'm so glad that Doug said that the Hagman Report will continue on in honor of his son. That way, Joe really does live on for all of us. Pastor David, I can't stop crying as I'm writing to you. My heart is broken at the loss. I'm overwhelmed with grief. There must be so many other people all around the world who are likewise grieving for Joe, the brother we never met, but who was such a huge part of our lives. I'm not exactly sure why I'm writing to you. I guess because you really are my pastor. You really are our pastor. We love Joe. Our lives won't be the same without him. Please pass on my deepest condolences to Doug and Renee, and please thank them for bringing into the world a wonderful, courageous, insightful, wise, funny, smart, compassionate, and world-changing human being, Joe Hagman, loved by so many around the world. We will continue to stand strong with Doug and the whole Hagman family as they and we face the future with greater resolve than ever. Thank you for listening, Pastor David. Thank you for being our pastor, especially in times such as these. May God continue to bless and protect you and all that you do. In the almighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And Rihanna, and I hope I say that correctly, in Australia. And that is truly my heart, everyone's heart. Uh, I was sharing yesterday with someone uh, from the time, you know, Steve and I began to do programs with the Hagmans. I watched a profuse and as well as profound growth, spiritual growth, in Joe's life. Um, his, his beginning, his little bit of knowledge, and then as he grew, his knowledge became exponential in the scriptures and tremendously and powerfully insightful. And for that, we're happy. And um, I'm, I'm happy that Doug has the will and the constitution, the fortitude to be strong in this hour, but the family needs our prayers. Uh, as Steve well said a moment ago, we're in this together, and we're fighting together. We're in this battle to win. And I would encourage everyone to financially support uh, Doug and the, the Hagman Report. Uh, pray for them. I know you're doing that, but don't let it pass in a week or two. Uh, I, I've done uh, scores and scores of funerals, probably nearly 100 funerals in my lifetime, and uh, after the first two or three weeks after that, people, you know, fall by the wayside. Nobody longer calls or, or visits or drops in or sends a kind word. So please don't forget them because every week that Doug goes to the microphone to share, um, he needs your strength. We, we, we combine all of our strength, all of our faith together for the sake of the family and the things that God wants to do. And I've said this so many times. If the devil can't get to you, he will certainly attack those closest to you. And we have certainly witnessed that this past week. And uh, I, I want to say thank you to everyone that have sent your condolences through us, through Steve, uh, and to directly to the Hagmans. And I know that they are very grateful and thankful. And I know they can sense your prayer uh, and your love. I spent uh, two hours on the phone with Doug yesterday, and my wife and I prayed with him so we need to continue to stand and support the work that he is doing. And don't let it slip. Don't let it slide out of the back of your mind in a few days and say, well, it's done. It's over with. Uh, this will make an indelible impression for the rest of their lives. And we want to help them uh, as they navigate through these tumultuous and tempestuous waters. Steve, what you said is so apropos, so correct. Uh, the the sin. And, you know, uh, yesterday, as I went into the office to do some programming, uh, there had already been over 100,000 hits on the YouTube uh, video that you posted uh, that, that Doug uh, made about a 13-minute video there. We're, we're, and, and Doug made a very profound statement. All of this, everything, uh, our, our political debacle, our demise of our nation, the passing of Joe, all of this evolves around the one little word called sin. And, I mean, Steve, you know, you're a few years older than me. 
we've watched over the 40-some years of our walk with God, this has grown exponentially. The sin, uh, the sodomy, uh, the lying, the castigation. Uh, in, in July this month, I, our newsletter was entitled America's Uncertainty. And this is a clash. This is a clash between good and evil. This is light and darkness. And, you know, Donald Trump helped to bring this divisiveness to the zenith and the pinnacle that it is now. You say, well, how can that be? Well, there's been much castigation about him uh, being a type of Cyrus in Isaiah chapter 45. And it talks about Cyrus being anointed. But I want people to understand the anointing that God has on Donald Trump's life. It's not an anointing uh, to preach, to teach, to prophesy. It is an anointing to clash with the world of sin and wickedness which we live in. And we as Americans, we need to get prepared for some devastating calamity, some unfathomable tragedy, or some uncomprehensible devastation. Something is coming. Uh, Steve, you said it uh, in, in Branson last year, things would change, and they would change directly, and uh, they, they would change quickly. And we are all, we are all right now beginning to feel, in a greater way than ever before, we're feeling the powers of darkness. We're sensing it. If you don't sense it, if you don't see it, uh, it's because you're not seeking the face, the counsel of God. Uh, the, the, the warfare is greater than it's ever been before. And, uh, Steve, as you well mentioned at the beginning of the program, how the church has become reprehensible, embracing sin. Uh, just a few weeks ago, Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House, she said, I pray for the president every day, yet she embraces sodomy, same-sex marriage, abortion. I ask the listeners today, what kind of a Christian can truly pray, seek to get into the presence and counsel of God, and still embrace those sins? How in the world can we we come to this state and place where we can make those kind of statements that, oh, I pray, I cry out to God, I pray for our president. But then they embrace these vile, these wicked sins. There has to be something wrong with their mind and with their spirituality. And when, when people, people like Nancy Pelosi do things like that, that's intentional. That is a ploy by Satan himself to twist true Christianity, and, 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 and make people deceived or cause people to become deceived by the masses. And, and, and if, they really, if she really was a Christian, she could not do these things. She could not embrace these things, but yet she does. And because of that, we're in the state and the place that we are today, and it is, it is such a tragedy. It, it is such a tragedy. And I want to encourage the people of God uh, to press in, to seek God. Uh, people who, who, who live like that, who, who say things like that, uh, uh, are, are truly deceived themselves. You know, the Pharisee said to Christ in uh, John nine thirty one. Now we know that God heareth not sinners. The only prayer that God hears from a sinner is a prayer of repentance. God be merciful to me, a sinner. God forgive me. And for people like Nancy Pelosi to say that I pray, I, I, I beseech the Lord in behalf of our president, yet embrace these gross sins, something is wrong. And churches and leadership and organizations are departing from the faith as never before. And, you know, people like Doug and Steve and myself and others who are on the front line, you know, we're, we're trying to hit this head on. And this is why we all need to pray one for another. Uh, pray that God would keep us strong, that God would help us to keep our minds in a sound state and place. Why? That we can be effective. And, and the, great, the, the, the greatest effectiveness is when we live and walk under the mantle of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit is upon anything, it has great Amen. power. And, and that's what we're looking for, is for the covering of the Spirit of God. Go ahead, Steve. 
I didn't mean to say amen. You can go. And again, David, uh, you know, I'm just yielding, and I'll share when I, I share. But I didn't say amen to stop you. Just to, You know what's weird? This is true, ladies and gentlemen. I'm on Bible Gateway, and the very first thing I opened up, I'm praying, Lord, where do you want me to go? I, I, I opened up to Proverbs 14:34. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And then, David, I got, you know, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Psalm 11, 3. And I think this is one of the things that people, and I'm praying, the the supernatural evil that's over this country is increasing dramatically. People are having all kinds of uh, encounters with darkness and evil spirits and all kinds of stuff. The purpose of this show today is to say, ladies and gentlemen, we've got this platform given to Doug by God. And I want to share something. If you don't really know the Doug that David and I know, and I don't think some of you realize, probably the most humble guy I've ever met. Now, you can make him angry, like anybody can be angry, okay? You can, you know, do all sorts of evil against a guy, claim all sorts of evil against a guy, but at the end of the day, he's one of the most humble men I've ever met. Would you agree with that, David? A- absolutely. Not only humble, but insightful and full of wisdom. Yes. Annoying, annoying so so here's speak. the deal. How does a PI, private eye, private investigator, get raised up to have basically one of the larger platforms for the remnant? And, and again, I want to talk, David, about the remnant, if you don't mind a little bit, because sure. I, I don't think people understand truly the lateness of the hour. And when I say that, it's almost become a cliche. Father, help me right now in Jesus' name to communicate yeah. as clear as I can communicate, as I've ever communicated, and to stay on track with this that you've placed within my heart yes, to Father. really speak about, Lord, in Jesus' name. Help David and I to flow together and help the blessing of Almighty God. Lord, David and I right now pray for a release of the Holy Ghost every yeah. ev- over every faithful listener, Lord, ever over everyone who's ever listened to this show, everyone who, Lord, is hungry for you, hunger for yeah. more, Lord, you and your word, Father, in Jesus' name, said you would command the angels, Almighty God, your angels, to go out in the highways and byways and command people to come in. And Lord, I pray, and would David and I agree in Jesus' name, that the veil of deception that's over modern Christendom, and even over people listening to this, Father, will be lifted, God, in Jesus' name, as it took It says it took Michael and Gabriel 21 days to get through to Daniel. I asked for 21 days, Lord, of release. Lord, I've never asked this before in my entire life, and I believe this is you. Lord, let everybody agree that those who are deceived in their families, those husbands, wives, children, I'm asking, Lord, children, I'm asking, Father, for a 21-day reprieve for the deception. And in those 21 days, I don't care if they're atheists, agnostics, people who hate me, people who hate Doug, people who hate David, and, Lord, all the haters out there, I pray for 21 days that that which causes them to basically be who they are, not what they could be. I'm asking for the deception to be broken. I'm asking God that you open their eyes, the eyes of their spirit, to the lateness of the hour. I ask that you show them, God, that Jesus, you're the Savior, not the knowledge of the stuff that's coming. That's going to save none of us. But Lord, the only thing that's going to save us is our, our, our pushing in, pressing in, calling upon you, Lord, and loving you, Jesus. And Lord, if if you remembered any of our sins, who could stand? But yet, Lord, as you forgive our sins, the wicked one it flaunts the sins, uh, provoking you, God, to destroy the nation that once was blessed by the living God. Father, again, everything that we've known as blessing is being taken from yes. us. Father, there's nothing that's going to be normal, but this is something I'm asking, God. In the place of abnormality, Father, I ask for the spirit of wisdom and revelation 
power and boldness, healing to those in body, healing to those in mind, a release of finances, Lord, a breaking of the spirit of loneliness, despair, and depression, and yes. God, a plan for each man and woman's lives. And Lord, I, I don't think I can understand or articulate, but when you say in 139th Psalm that more numerous than the sand of the sea are your thoughts to each and every one of the people you have created, God, that means it's infinite. So, Lord, you don't run out of good ideas for Pastor Langford or run out of good ideas for me, Lord, even though even though sometimes we wonder, God, what's the next step? But, Lord, your people around the world today need to hear this, that, yea, if you and you are for them, who can be against them? Lord, I pray for the spirit of cowardice. I pray for the spirit of denial to be broken over the people of God's life. I pray for the spirit of guilt to be broken over the men of God's life, that they might arise and raise and be raised up a mighty army. And Father, we just thank you. Now we bless Doug and we bless Renee. We bless Eric and, and, and Doug's daughter and all associated with this. And Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, there there's so many underlying uh, reasons for stuff, but Lord, Joe was taken captive. And let that be a, a, a real reminder to everybody, Lord. You came to set the captives free. Lord, Certain things are in your hand and in your judgment, the times and seasons. But, Lord, certain things are in our hands that you've given us to do and to bind the powers of darkness, to loose the angels of Almighty God. And, Lord, we just loose the angels of Almighty God today to the ministering angels. That's biblical, Lord. Your word says it, to go and minister to the people worldwide, whether it's a woman in Australia, whether it's the people that are in the outback, Kid Yowie, all these people that are out there listening to us, some will drive, Lord, for, for five days to get just to be able to download and, and, and broadcast, record broadcast. So, Father, you, God, have it under control. I pray your people understand this, that it's going to wax worse and worse. And, Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you, Lord, for the conviction your word brings when Pastor Langford preaches. Father, you chasten and rebuke those of us you love. Yeah. And Lord, some of us need it. And God, I'm grateful for it because Lord, I'm not a bastard. Although a lot yeah. of people would call me that. But we're not a bastard, Lord, because we're adopted into the family of God. Oh, hallelujah. So Father, in Jesus' name, we lose the spirit of revelation today. We lose the spirit of true biblical prophecy. We lose, Lord, your entire purpose over this broadcast. Amen. Yeah. And, and so be it in Jesus' name. So be yeah. it. No, you know what I'm going to change, David, how I pray? So continue it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead, sir. That's a, that's a great prayer, Steve. You know, America has been given so much, and we have taken it for granted. Uh, God has blessed us, and, and, and usually in the case of the nation of Israel, the last blessing before judgment would be one of prosperity. You know, we talk about cycles. They come, they go, recession, depression, uh, booming economy, whatever. It is the hand of God. And because this is one of the last nations, countries in the world that has a, a, a remnant of people uh, that confess and profess Christ as their Lord and as their Savior, the problem is, and Steve, the article you sent me this morning uh, about the Lutheran churches, uh, and, and when we say a denomination, Steve and I are not castigating those of you who may still be affiliated with a denomination. But I was thinking about all the things I was reading there this morning, Steve, and how that the substitutionary church is a whore. She's a harlot. And now they're wanting to call God a woman, female. And if the church is the bride... And now you have a female a God, you have lesbianism. Uh, this is why I've been so adamant the last five to six years to tell people the church is the body of Christ. It's not the bride of Christ. New Jerusalem is the bride of Christ. The Bible says that plain and clear in Revelation 21 and 2, Revelation 21 and 9. It is clear. So the, the devil always brings something that is totally in opposition to what God presents to us. And God presents to us pure, unadulterated truth. And then these hirelings, these hucksters, they come along. They corrupt the Word of God. They corrupt the Word of God purposefully. They have an intent. They have a plan. They have a purpose. 
2 Corinthians 2, 17, Paul says, We are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Neither are Steve and I as many which corrupt the word of God. And they corrupt the word, they twist the word, they distort the word for the purpose of deceiving the people of God. Now, Paul the Apostle already warned us, this is what men would do in Ephesians 4 and 14. He says that we henceforth be no more children. Why does he use the phrase children? Children are immature. We're not to be immature children. We're to be mature adults in the Scriptures. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Their whole purpose, their whole intention, is to deceive the people of God. Uh, in Galatians, Paul called them false brethren. Now, that, 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 that's, that's an oxymoron, to say the least. But this is what's happened to the church. These are false brethren. And what did Paul say? Uh, Galatians 2, 4, and that because of false brethren, unawares, people don't discern it, they don't catch it, brought in, who came in privately to spy out our liberty that we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. All false doctrine, all heresy, is for the purpose of bringing the people of God into bondage. But I love Paul's response there in verse 6, Galatians 2 and 6. But of these who seem to be somewhat, oh, they think they're great. They think they have a magnificent platform. But of these who seem to be somewhat, and I love it in, in, the, in the King James, it's in parentheses, whatsoever they are, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth or exalteth no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. These people, these charlatans, these hucksters, they add absolutely nothing to the body of Christ, to the people of God, but rather they take away, they steal, they rob, they pillage. And I, I witnessed this, Steve, you're witnessing the, those articles today, were absolutely off the charts trying to feminize God. The disciples said, teach us to pray. Jesus said, our Father, who art in heaven. The masculinity is a man. It, it's, it's not a female. It's a father, a father figure. And yet, they want to twist that. And this is perversion. This is perversion. I, I said to you, know, to you some weeks ago, Steve, all of this sodomy, transgenderism, all of this craziness, it's not so much about sex as it is about perversion. About perversion. This is, this is what the enemy seeks to do, is to pervert everything, and in the end, he wants to pervert the gospel, Galatians 1 and 7, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert. And the word pervert there means to corrupt the gospel of Christ. And religion, religion and religiosity has taken a stronghold in true Christianity. And you know, this is why those of you listening, you're going to have to come out of the harlot system. Uh, regretfully, most organizations, most denominations have been contaminated. They have been infiltrated with sodomy, with adultery, with fornication, uh, lying, cheating, embezzling money. It, 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 it's terrible. It's terrible. And so in Revelation 18, 4, he says, Come out of her, my people. Why? That proves biblically the church is masculine because it's the body of Christ. Anatomically, only a man can come out of a woman. Come out of her, my people. Why? That you do not be a partaker of her, of her plagues. The, the wrath of God, that's the seven vials, the seven bowl judgment, Revelation 15, 1, Revelation 16, 1. Those vials are what God is going to pour out on this harlot church. That's why he says, come out of her, because I'm going to pour it out. Now, I thank God uh, that there are a lot of men that are being awakened to the truth, and they're preaching repentance. They're, 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 they're tired of the soft soap peddlers, and they're refraining uh, from being a part of that. And you're going to see, and, and I hate the term independent, 
You know, if you're not a part of an organization, they say, well, he's an independent. No, they've come out of the harlot system. They are really more dependent upon God than the organizations are, because the organization is depending on itself. So they're really the ones independent, and yet they use the terminology on us. Oh, when I left the Church of God, he's now independent. No, I'm not. I am now more dependent on Jesus Christ than ever before. And the organizations are dependent upon themselves. And great will be your grief. What was the man that trusts in the arm of the flesh? You know, it, it, it's in times like these uh, that, 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 that Doug is facing, and we're all facing. We need the arm of God. We need the hand of God. And, you know, one of the great things I love about God is his eternal, everlasting, unwavering love toward his people. The devil may tell you every day you wake up, God does not love you. Well, remember, the devil cannot tell the truth. So that absolutely means God does love you because the devil is a liar. Jeremiah thirty one three says this. I'm going to give it back to you, Steve. The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. It is the very kindness of God, extending his unfathomable love to us and to draw us to him. God doesn't want anyone to perish. God goes out of his way to save and to redeem. And so as we enter into the great tribulation, and I say that with with all respect, and I'm not castigating if you're a pre-tribulationist, the truth is you're in error. But we're going into this period, and it's going to be one of the greatest tempestuous times that man has ever seen. And we're just, these, these are the birth pains. War, rumors of wars, those are birth pains. But Jesus said this, the end is not yet. And we're getting into a very, very tenuous place for America, to say the least. Go ahead, Steve. Well, David, I I have a letter for me that I've never been released, and this was written to me on February 11th, 2004. I can send it to you, and uh, I'm going to publish it because I felt like, you know, there's a time for everything, even the book of Ecclesiastes. I've made this statement over and over, but how many times have you as a pastor, you know, been in a pulpit as an evangelist warning people of the days to come, but the days that are here? If America understood, and I, I this is some, I, I heard a preacher one time, and I forget who it was, maybe, um, oh, it was one of the greats, you know, maybe even Leonard Ravenhill or somebody of that caliber. I don't think it was Leonard. So many people in, impacted my life, the old men of God who stood for the old rugged cross and had the anointing. And the anointing is what's missing in most people's lives. The thing is, is that, that you know, the the word that the Lord wants us to do is obviously stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherein Jesus Christ has set us free and be not again entangled in the yoke of bondage. We are like, uh, we're like entangled in every, local, every yoke of bondage. Sorry, now I want to read this because it's important to what we're talking about today, okay? And it's talking about what we're seeing right now, okay? And this was written to me by a very powerful man in the military. I'm not going to give anything away. And and I will say this, for those of you who can figure this out, you know, not even not even necessarily, um, you know, he's not dead, but I can tell you this, he's not on this planet. And I'm not talking anything wooey or anything like that. But here is it, it, it's, it's interesting. He's talking about... Uh, the phase which is now just starting. Now, he wrote this in 2004 to me. I'll publish it with a header and stuff. Just names will be crossed out. He said, the next phase, which is now just starting, but has yet to reach its climax, will be a wave of man-made catastrophes, along with man-made plagues being set upon the U.S. The focus is to get all the people of the country gathered into the central part of the country. You will see the issuing of a national ID card. The card will be ushered in by a rash of elderly adults and young children being abducted or missing. They already have the power over the old, uh, old, the young, and those in the prison and military. This is where the ID chip program has already started. Now, he goes on to say this. 
he goes on to say, and, and some military units, and this is important because we're right in the time now where, where we're talking about the mark of the beast. How many times have you gotten into arguments, David, with people over the mark of the beast, okay? Oh, yeah, oh, absolutely. I don't believe it's a literal mark. I don't believe the mark of the beast. There's not a real beast. The two witnesses aren't real humans. It's just the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, malarkey. How's that? That's my new word, <laughs> malarkey. Oh, thank you, Lord. Uh, it, <laughs> yeah, I, uh, listen, my tongue looks like uh, a chopped liver right now. I'm biting it. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, is it, 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 we're talking about what's going on right now. He said this. Some military units, this is in 2004, some military units were given ID chips in their dog tags, and some units stationed near you in Montana were given implants in their hands when they sieged Panama. While in Panama, they didn't have to use money or show ID. Their hands were just scanned to make purchases or enter into secured areas. The interesting scientific issue with the back of the hand, now I didn't know this, and the forehead, is that these two regions of the body send out a small electrical pulse strong enough to power a chip. Nobody's ever said that that I know of, okay? He said, now, once the integrity of the ID cards is destroyed by fraud and crime, the next phase will be to totally integrate the ID chip program. Every person on this planet will be tracked. Remember, 2004. In order to receive this chip, you'll have to renounce any religious affiliations. Those that openly refuse will be sent to what are now being called recycling centers. There, your free will will either be broken so that you can return to society or you will be sent to one of the military bases that have been closed down and turned into recertification camps. At these camps, those that are deemed to be radicals, such as true pastors, military leaders who refuse to go along with the program, and Christians who are in leadership roles will be killed on the spot. I, and by the way, this is a four-star active duty general. This is not a guy that, you know, is he's still alive. I'm saying that he is still alive. I do not want to stipulate that, although I'm not drawing a timeline. I'm giving markers to look for. Once you see some of these events begin to occur, then these events will uh, begin to cascade like dominoes falling. Are we not seeing that, Pastor? The year to, your word that God gave you, was it last year or the year before acceleration? That was in 2012, Steve, believe it or not. Seven years ago. Well, are you sure I'm older than you? Because I seem to have lost <laughs> 70 years. And, and I, you know, people say, how can you not know that? It's because it's not important to me. What's important to me, and I'm serious, Those are, and you know me pretty well, Pastor, you know. But we've yeah. been best friends for a long time, but I'm paying attention to the events because I used to want to know the time, and Jesus said the events will determine the time. That's what this general is saying, and God bless you, Professor, wherever you are. And I, that's not disingenuous. That's a genuine God bless him. Going on, and I'll, I'll, I just want to talk about this, because I do not think people understand the lateness of the hour. And doesn't Scripture say even when, the, when Noah's flood came, they, they didn't even know the day or the hour of their demise? No, right. they mocked it. The messenger. And so, David, here is the thing. Again, ladies and gentlemen, and this is about the position. I don't know. Doug, how many times have you heard Doug say, Steve, I'm a private investigator. I don't know how I got into the radio business. My answer is always the same. Simple, Doug. God saw your heart and put you there. I remember, and I want to share a story about Doug Hagman that most people don't know. Maybe you remember those of you listening to me, you know, for 20 years or whatever, but when Doug and I first met, uh, almost 20 years ago, 19 years ago, uh, I was getting such severe death threats from a certain area in New York, and they were, they were, uh, Islamic radicals at that time, uh, went to the FBI. They would pretty much do nothing, and, you know, they never said they couldn't do anything. But Doug laid it on the line for me, and, and David, he went into literally you know, and I won't say where, you know, but he went into New York and he tracked down, you know, what was going on, the pay phones that were being used. And he was on the phone with me and he said this, he said, you say the word and I'll be there. And as long as it get, takes to get a ticket, the guy, and he's done that on multiple times. And, you know, people think that I sit around probably, you know, making this stuff up. It's real. You knew about some of that stuff going on in real time. The vile tapes I would get, you know, the vile threats against my family, still get the threats and vile tapes. But the point is, is that, or vile emails, but the point is, Doug's that kind of a guy. And ladies and gentlemen, I just want to thank you all from the depths of my heart. If it had not been for Doug Hagman, if it were not for Doug Hagman, if it were not for those of you who generously support him. And by the way, if this is your church, 
This is the storehouse, and a storehouse is where you get fed. Because, you know, David, I want you to address this, and I'll turn it right over to you. I'm not finished reading the letter, and I'll come back to it. But we're there. It's accelerating. The word God gave you is accelerating. And people would better understand, when Doug's gone, unless their relationship with Jesus has been nurtured, there's no place to turn. There's no keystroke to hit. There's no, uh, I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, the only one that can take any of us through is Jesus by way of his Holy Spirit. Go ahead, Pastor. Well, and that's, that's why it is so imperative that we work on our relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, none of us spend too much time in prayer. None of us spend too much time in the scriptures. Uh, we spend too much time in a little phone. And when, as you read that letter about the forehead and the hand, the pulse, well, guess what? They check your pulse right at your hand. Uh, they check your pulse in your neck close to your head. And when you said that, read that, it made all the sense in the world to me that there is a, a light pulse coming out. And I, w- I want to say this today. There are those of you listening to tonight to this program. You're listening to people who are so, what's the word am I looking for? They are so twisted in the truth and in doctrine. There are those who are preterist, preterist, however you want to pronounce it, preterist. They don't believe the book of Revelation, yet the book of Revelation talks about the mark of the beast. They don't believe there's a thousand-year millennial reign of Christ, yet six consecutive times in Revelation chapter 20, verses 2 through 7, the phrase, a thousand years, 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 is used, yet they refute that. They say there's, there's no mark of the beast. That all happened, I believe, during the uh, Vespasian and Titus, the, Roman, when they, the Romans, when they came in there and seized Jerusalem. You have people who say today you can take the mark of the beast and still repent. That is in total opposition to the word of God. The Bible said in Revelation 14, 9, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which will be poured out without mixture. In other words, it is full strength. It's like taking pure Clorox and pouring it on a pair of blue jeans. It'll eat a hole in them and bleach them out. You water it down, you dilute it, it won't be as powerful. This is what he means when he says he's going to pour out his wrath without mixture. It will not be diluted in any capacity. And, and, and we have people who are listening to people who are espousing this. we we, we got people today uh, that claim to be Christians uh, embracing Noahide laws. We, we've got people who are professing to be Christians uh, that, that argue uh, the scriptures, and, and they hate Jewish people. You know what? During the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, the church, the body of Christ, the blood-bought, born-again children of God, are going to go up every year to Jerusalem to Jerusalem, and we're going to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, the Bible says. Uh, 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 Zechariah 14, verses 16 and 17. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem, those that are left, so that tells you there's going to be a massacre, those that are left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. So, so we, we see the scriptures are clear. Uh, I, I marvel at the ignorance, how people want to get involved in anti-Semitism. What does the Bible prophesy? Zechariah 4, uh, 12 and 3. And that day, while I make Jerusalem, a burdensome stone for all people, all that burden themselves with it. Why do you want to castigate Israel? Why do you want to castigate Jerusalem? You're fulfilling Bible prophecy, but you're so blind and so deceived, you can't see you're fulfilling the Scriptures. Why would you burden yourself with these things? Because you are deceived. And, and deception, my God, I've never witnessed so much deception all of my life. I, you know, that's why I pray. That's why I bathe my mind 
in the Word of God, I ask God, Lord, don't let me be deceived about anything. Don't let me believe heresy. Don't let me embrace fallacy. I don't even want to be yoked up with people who are in error and false doctrine. And and, and Steve, brother, it has exploded. Uh, the, the error, the false doctrine, the, the spirit of truth, and the spirit of error is colliding every waking day of our lives. And the Bible said it would be like that in the last days. First uh, John chapter 4, verse 6. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. Now, that sounds a little self-serving, a little uh, self-aggrandizing. But we are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. The spirit of error. And that spirit is running rampant in America. We, we see the uncovering of all the sins. And that was the prophecy the Lord gave you, Steve, before God judged America. He would let the, 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 the populace, he would let them see, let us see how corrupt our government is. This, I've, I've never witnessed anything like it in my life. You know, it, it, it's hard to trust anybody anymore. Because when you watch this and you see the cover-up, and Donald Trump, you know, it's amazing how God gives him the right phraseology. Sleepy Joe, Nancy, uh, Nervous Nancy. It's, it's like he has the, uh, the ability to look at somebody and see them for who and what they are. And fake news, it, it's like, it's a, it's like a, a, a two-edged sword. And it, it, it's humorous in a sense that he gives everybody a name. You know, Klein Chuck. I mean, it, it's, just, it's, a, it's phenomenal. And, and yet... The Christian church sits in darkness, and they're like, well, what are we waiting for? Well, we're just waiting for the Lord to come. We better get the whole armor of God on. We better go into battle, because if you don't, you're going to be run over by the horsemen. They're going to trample over the people of God. Why? Because the people of God aren't being warned correctly. It's prosperity. It's blessed me. Let's have a good time. You know, your best life now. I've never seen so much junk. And uh, preachers are, 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 are doing the church a, 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 a disservice in not getting into the closet, getting a hold of the hem of his garment, and coming out of the closet and saying, Thus saith the Lord. You know, that, that's why as a minister, and I can say this because I am one, I, I watch these ministries and ministers, and, and I witness the reason they don't preach anything with conviction is, number one, they're not in the presence of God. They're not in the presence of God. When you get in the presence of God, you see yourself for who you really are. And, you know, I, I, I marvel at Isaiah, how chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, he, he's preaching, you know, with conviction that would slam anybody. But yet, when he sees God, Elohim, in Isaiah chapter 6, he says, Woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. What caused him to see himself in that manner? He saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train, his glory, filled the temple. And, and he saw that, and he's like, oh, my Lord, look at me now. I am filthy. I am immoral. I am undone. And so the, the uh, seraphim... Uh, goes and takes a coal from the altar of God, uh, which I believe would be the either blazing altar or the altar of incense. But nevertheless, it was a coal. And he took that piece of coal, and he touched it on Isaiah's lips. And he says, Thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. It wasn't the tongs. It wasn't the altar. It wasn't the coal, it was the fire that was in the coal. And the fire is a type of Jesus Christ. He comes in flaming fire. Uh, we're told in the, uh, Hebrews 12 and 29, our God is a consuming fire. And that's what touched the lips of Isaiah and changed him. And when anyone gets into the presence of God in that manner, in that magnitude, that's what happens. That's what happens. Our lives are changed because of the fire 
the fire of God. And Deuteronomy 4, uh, he told Israel, he said, the reason God did not manifest himself, where you could see a man, a similitude, an image, was so you did not try to attempt to make an idol by your hand and say, now this is a similitude, this is a facsimile of God, this is who this is. So he said, Moses says, he came in thunder, lightning, fire, earthquake, manifestations of God's presence, but never able to witness and see God. For John said in John one eighteen, no man has ever seen God. No man. The only time we see God is when he's manifest through his son, Jesus Christ. And so here we are today. We can behold him. We can get into his presence. He wrote the veil from the top to the bottom, and then he put a, a, a mat at the mercy seat, so that everyone, every one of you can come in boldly to the throne of grace to find help in the day of trouble. And so as we enter into these end times, it's like a funnel. You know, you pour gas or water or anything into a funnel. The, the top is very large, and you can get a lot of fluid in there. But when it starts to go down into the funnel, it gets narrower and narrower, and, and it becomes very, very compact. That's exactly what the word tribulation means. It means pressure. It means distress. And that's where we're headed. Now, I, I know people don't want to hear that, but you've got to remember, Jesus related it as a woman in labor about to bring forth a child. The labor pains become more frequent, and the labor pains become more painful, more severe, more extreme. Well, that's what we're all witnessing right now, more severity, the crops. Uh, the, the wars, the rumors of wars, the earthquakes, uh, food, famine, pestilence, uh, the diseases in California, the diseases coming through across the border. It's like, what in God's name is going on? And as Doug so well said the other day, it's because of sin. You're trying to take God out. And you, you gave the scripture there, Stephen, Proverbs 14, 34. Blessed uh Righteousness exalts the nation, but sin is a reproach unto any people. And then in Psalms 33, 12, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And when you take God out, you simply lose the blessing. And that's why we're losing the blessing of God, because we're taking God out, and we're putting the garbage and filth and, and debasedness and degradation in its place. I'm going to give it back to you, Steve. Well, David, we are at the time period that the prophets longed to look into, that many of the prophets saw but did not have the freedom or luxury of the words. And, you know, I want to take people to the book of Revelation. When I first started my, my publishing, you know, attempt or whatever with my company uh, and, you know, uh, succeeded with some of the things that I believe God has put in my heart, but I named it End Time Thunder. And it was interesting that I chose that name because um, in the day that I chose that, almost, I guess, 25 years ago, the thing that fascinated me about the book of Revelation is that the thunders that basically are sealed up, John was told not to reveal those. So I went through and started praying, and only recently, I mean literally in the last three months to six months, six months would be more accurate, as the way I tell time, so you can probably say, no, Steve, you said that two years ago. But the point is, is that we're, we're at the time now when you see God's thunder, you think about it, you think about the storms, obviously there was thunder and lightning when Elijah was hiding out, and yet it said God's voice, God was in the still small voice. You see the thunders and lightning even in, in the plagues on Egypt, and you see it, you see whenever God appeared, even at Mount Sinai, and told uh, Moses, prepare the people. He's going to come down and, and talk to them. And, I t I, you know, you and I have talked about this on the radio. I think that's the law. Uh, that was the biggest mistake the children of Israel ever made, because had they sat and listened to the convicting voice of God from Sinai, they wouldn't have turned to the whoredoms they did after that event in Sinai. So the thing is, is that when God begins to thunder his voice, it's in, and I can't separate it, it's basically either an act of creation or destruction. 
because it's fascinating to me that, again, the context of time could not, and I don't know what the seven thunders are. I want to make it clear. I've had people tell me that they're the two witnesses. I had a guy tell me he's Jesus. I said, well, I know Jesus. You're not Jesus. And, uh, you know, then he said, well, do you know the two witnesses? And I said, uh, maybe one. And, and he said, well, can you tell me who the other one is? And I said, brother, you just proved yourself. If you ask me who the other one is, you're not him. I mean, I'm not kidding you. It's that ridiculous. But, David, we are in the point now where when God's judgments are in the earth, men depart from wickedness. Isn't that the scripture? Right. And the wickedness of mankind now, and, and Jesus said it, there's never been anything like it, nor will be again. And I quote the scripture all the time, and except for the righteous sake, those days be numbered, or, or, or shortened, forgive me, not numbered, shortened, there be no flesh left alive. Even while we're talking, David, the plans for the extinction of mankind are on, ongoing, and people who are, you know, the people who are in compartmentalized intelligence areas of the government don't uh, understand how they're, they're working with this stuff. They've been fed the lie. They'll be kings and gods in the New World Order. But, you know, isn't that going back to the, the oldest lie? I in Genesis, ye shall be as gods, ye shall not surely die. So what I think is critical, people, is this. We are in the time of the end. Now, Pastor Langford, of all the people you know, because you were, you know, officially you were in the Church of God until the Lord led you out of that. And I remember when we first met, I said, David, you're, and, and I call him David, ladies and gentlemen, because he's my friend, but when he's in the pastor role, he's Pastor Langford. But I said, David, I've learned one thing. You're never going to be, you're never good for God or used by God until you're kicked out of their kingdom and brought into his own. You remember I said that? Absolutely, you told me that. And so the thing is, is that, ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you something. Some of you are trembling in your boots that God is, that your your uh, place of fellowship is nothing more than basically a licentious den of robber barons, and I'm not saying all, but I'm saying the, the emails I get, what am I to do? Ah, look to Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. And I get calls from an e email. I had an email from a lady, and, and God bless you, sister, in uh, someplace in Australia. She says, do you know any Christians in my area? I said, said, no, but God does, and if you pray, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll lead you to it. And I said, unfortunately not, and I'm sure she listens to this broadcast. So what I guess I'm trying to say is this. You can no longer, there is no longer freedom of, um, I'll do what I feel like I should do when I feel like I should do it. We are in the time frame unlike any other. And, Pastor, I was literally praying, uh, and I, I pray without ceasing. I have conversations with the Lord saying, God, I don't want to miss it. I don't want to mislead your people. Lord, I don't know how long I have on earth, but I want to be faithful. I don't want to wimp out on Jesus. Lord, help me. And when that day comes, Lord, you'll take me through whatever I got to go through. And and trust me, David, the thing that is, no, not don't trust me. That's a I shouldn't say that. Trust the Lord Jesus. And everybody, trust the Lord Jesus. David Langford's never asked you to trust him. I've never asked you to trust him. I, I said, take it to the Lord in prayer. And take it to the Lord in prayer means I expect God to answer. People say, I never hear from God. I said, then pour your heart out to him in true honesty. And most of those people admit, well, I was hiding a certain thing. Let me make it easy for people. As a, uh, a poster child for sinners, me, God knows everything anyway, and there's a cleansing. Only the blood of Jesus can cleanse. And by the way, you know, the the whole idea of the blood sacrifice of the the baby butchers, of the cannibals who are eating little human babies and eating growing babies. Cannibalism, and, and again, what's neat about being on with you, David, you and I have been blessed by Doug Hagman allowing us the forum. And when people criticize, they don't understand how many people have come to the Lord Jesus worldwide. Doesn't it amaze you some of the emails? This, ladies and gentlemen, would not happen without Doug. We're not flattering him. We're giving God praise for him that through his obedience you get to be blessed and now he's a, a, you know going through one of the toughest things a father can go through somebody said it's not for parents to build, bury their children it's supposed to be the other way around and there's other people out there like Joe Hagman right now that you're snagged in drugs 
You're snagged in uh, 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 perversion. You're snagged in pornography. You know what the Lord showed me? Why? And, and I know a lot about pornography, and I'm not proud of it. And I don't, you know, I think it's horrid. But the thing is, is that it is the Delilah factor in most men's life that causes guilt to come in. And then it's like uh, Samson when he had his head shaved. They become slaves and they can no longer see. God will forgive you that. God will cleanse you from that. And and David, we're at a time now when there's no word to even describe what's going on in that world, except you see it on drudge, you see it in rock and roll, you see it. It is so profane and this is nothing. And this is nothing to compare to what's coming. If the church can't, and I'm going to turn it right over to you, if the church can't deal with what is, won't be honest where, where people are at, then the point is, is that how are we going to handle it? And I'm saying we, I'm talking true believers, when, when basically, you know, the roundups come and you watch someone you love, and I pray this doesn't happen to anybody listening, but people you love, you know, uh, shot, murdered before your eyes. And, you know, it, it just, I don't know how to play, um, you know, I, I, not play, I don't know how to get people to quit playing end times and start acting like they're in them. Does that make sense to you? Well, absolutely. Uh, the word is discipline. Uh, that's where we, the root word of discipleship comes from discipline. You're disciplined to the tenets, the dogma, the doctrine of whomever you're following. If you're following Jesus, you embrace his doctrine, uh, his truth, his principles. And this is, this is what's going to separate the sheep from the goat. Um, first of all, you know, Solomon said in Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So many people today hear the truth, but then they spurn it. Then you have people uh, like Alexander Cortez uh, who lie. Uh, I was was laughing. I'll share this uh, just as a point of humor. She said those people were drinking out of toilets. Well, I've been in jail before, and on the tank, on the commode, at the top, instead of having a lid on it, they have a water fountain on it. I, 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 I regret my sins. I've been locked up. I've been in jail. So you, you have a, actually a, a push-button water valve on the tank part to drink water, and it's, it's all because water comes into the commode. So you're not drinking out of the bowl uh, part. You're drinking out of the tank part, the clean water. But I thought, she's so stupid, she doesn't even know what she's talking about when she says they're drinking out of toilets. Well, that's true in a sense. But it's, it's always to to fragment, to skew the truth, to make people think they're actually, you know, drinking water from the bowl where they defecate. That's not true. Uh, as I said, if you've ever been to jail in the 70s, I don't know what they have now, probably better amenities than that, but that's, that's the way it is. My point is, we're witnessing people... Just look at you and absolutely misrepresent the truth. Uh, and, and how we sit by and don't realize the gravity of it. You like your health care? You keep your health care. You like your doctor? You keep your doctor. Folks, these are lies. And, 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 and they're, they're blatant lies. I mean, we're, we're being lied to literally. And I'll never forget Adrian Rogers' profound statement. He said, no man is more like the devil than when he lied. And I reason that's one of the reasons I, I try my best uh, to, to maintain my integrity and always speak the truth. Uh, I try to live my life in a way that I don't have to lie or have to recant on something I said or did or try to change what I said to something else because that's what wicked people do. Romans one twenty two says, uh, who, uh, Romans one twenty five who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator. Well, you know who the creature is? It's Satan. Satan is a, is a creature. He was a created being. The creator is Jehovah Elohim. Changing the truth of God into a lie. All truth is, is, is godly because it's truth. It's righteousness. And so we're, we're, we're in this hour when everything that we're hearing, everything that we're seeing is, is a sham it is a subterfuge. Even people who claim to be professing Christians, why are they lying? Because they're deceived. They don't 
know the truth. They don't take the time to know the truth. They don't take the time to seek out what is the truth about this matter. That's why I love word etymology, origin. Where did it come from? Why? Why is it like that? Uh, I shared some time ago about a false flag. Well, you've heard that profusely since 9-11, but it's a, it's a, it's a 15th century term where a ship full of pirates would put up a false flag, that they were a friendly ship. Uh, they were a helpful uh, ship of men. But then when they got close enough to the ship they wanted to attack, it was too late. And, and that's what it meant to fly a false flag. It's deception. And, you know, it's used in politics. It's used in national governments to blame another country for something that they did and look like the other countries are, are the ones that did it. This is, this is going on. Satan's victory. Every victory Satan has ever had was based on a lie. He lied to Adam and Eve. He got victory over them because they believed his lie. And I want to say this before I give it back to Steve. I know there are those of you, 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 you are uncertain. Uh, you're concerned about what Steve and I talk about, the, the, the perilous days, the great tribulation. Uh, I got an email this morning from a lady said, a woman told her, if there's no pre-tribulation rapture, I'm going to turn my back on God. Well, that's very arrogant to say the least. But that's the hypocrisy and the arrogancy of, of so-called Christian people. But see, God knows who we are. He knows how we're going to handle a situation or a circumstance. He knows who has the ability to deal with whatever. Out of the 12 sons of Jacob, God chose Joseph. Joseph was unique, but God had made him like he was. So he was the one that God chose to be sold into slavery, uh, to then be bought, to then be put back in prison for the the uh, adulterous attempt that Potiphar's wife uh, blamed him for. Uh, all of these things. And so God knows who we are and how we're going to handle and deal with situations that come to us. And this is why I want to share this passage in Hebrews 11. Because some of you say, I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if I'll overcome. I don't know if I'll say no. I don't know if I can be strong in that hour of temptation or, or adversity. Well, here's what the Bible says in 33. says, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. I won't get into all of that, but who stopped the mouths of lions? Well, David did, uh, Samson did, uh, Daniel did. He didn't even touch them. He just laid his head down at night, went to, to sleep in that pit with all those lions. But God stopped the mouths of the lions, quenched the violence of fire, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again. That was Elijah. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. Now, uh, history says Isaiah was cut in two with a timber saw. Uh, some say he was in, hiding in a tree. And so when they cut the tree down, they cut him in two. Others say he was pulled out of the tree, then he was cut in two with a timber saw. Uh, so women received their, dead, received their dead raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. History says that Peter said, I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Lord. Hang me upside down. Well, he didn't want deliverance. He, he wanted to die this way. He said, don't hang me like my Lord. Turn me upside down. I'm not worthy. And then it says that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others had trial of cruel mocking and scourging, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder, that's Isaiah. They were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskin and goatskin, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens, caves of the earth. David did a lot of that. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Having, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us, should be made part per perfect. In other words, they're going to partake of the same inheritance and the same blessing uh, all of us will. 
And so when you feel like you don't know how you're going to be able to handle this, let me assure you that God is the God of all comfort, according to 2 Corinthians 1 and 4. Because he's the God of all comfort, he knows exactly how and when and the way to comfort us. Second um, Corinthians 1 and 4, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. So, so Paul says God is the God of all comfort. And it doesn't matter where you find yourself. All men find themselves in times of peril, uh, times of tribulation, uh, times of affliction, uh, times of fiery darts being shot at us. God is aware of all of this. None of this is, 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 is catching God off guard. God sees every bit of it. And you think, well, does God care about me? Absolutely. Psalms thirty-one, fifteen. David said, my times are in your hands. Whether it's a time of joy, it's a time of sorrow, a time of happiness, a time of sadness, a time of bereavement, you're in the hand of God, and God is aware of this particular time in your life. Uh, We've all used the term, my children used it all the time when they were little, Daddy, that's not fair. Daddy, that's not fair. Well, there's there's an element of truth in that, Uh, especially when you're living right, you're doing right. And you're suffering. You're, you're suffering pain. You're suffering heartache. You're suffering maybe of a literal broken heart because of a wayward son, a wayward daughter, or a wayward spouse. All of these things, our Heavenly Father watches all of that. And this is why we never quit. Because God is always on time concerning our deliverance. Now, I've said it a thousand times. He's the most late on-time God I've ever seen. In my, from my perspective, he's always late. But the truth is, he's always on time. He knows when to show up. And he allows us to get to that place to where he says, you're going to have to trust me. You're going to have to believe me. If it, Listen, I find it amazing. We can believe God, every one of us that are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. We believe if we died right now, we're going to heaven. Yet, we struggle to believe God for daily bread. We struggle to believe God will answer a prayer. We struggle to believe God to fix this matter or this issue for us. Yet you have professing faith that, hey, I believe I'm washed in his blood. I'd go to heaven right now if I passed away. Yet in our in our temporal, uh, fragile human state, we grapple with daily bread. Well, I don't know if God can supply the bread. I don't know if God can help me with the bills. I don't know if God can get me through that. That is a pure lack of faith, and I was with Jimmy D. Smith uh, this past week, and I was in Tennessee. He made a very profound statement to me. He said, true faith is no matter what the outcome is, you still trust God. If your prayer was not answered like you wanted it, the situation did not unfold like you wanted it, the circumstances were not made better, but they may have gotten worse. He said, but true faith says, Lord, you know what's best. So I'm going to trust you in spite of what I witness with my own eyes that you're working this out for my betterment. Maybe we can't see it now. Things happen today that we may not understand until five years away. And then the, 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 the perspective becomes clear. You can see why God let it go this way. And that's why I love Joseph. Oh, I love him so much. Because in the end, his brothers after Jacob died, the brothers were afraid Joseph would get even. And he said to his brothers, you still don't understand. God sent me before you to save lives, not to destroy. And, and they never could get that revelation. Joseph was sent before them to make a way for their uh, survival, to literally grow a nation physically, physically grow this nation called Israel. But they still couldn't see that. But Joseph could. He saw so far in the future. He said, hey. 175 years from now, God's going to visit you guys. Don't leave my bones in Egypt. When God gets ready to, to leave, bring you out, take my bones out with you. He could see. Why? Because he trusted God, no matter where he found himself, no matter what was taking place, that God 
would make divine provision for him. I'm going to give it back to you, Steve. We're out of time, David, you know, and again, we're out of time and out of time because, you know, the passing of Joe, it happened unexpectedly. It happened at a time that was not expected, and when I say not only unexpectedly, but no one was prepared for it. The call and the cry of a, of a watchman's heart, of a pastor's ministry, is that we don't know one day from the next, unless God has given us a, a word of you know, uh, prophetic uh, knowledge, or is that, look, when you're 45 is going to happen? I'm not talking about that. But life changes immensely. I want to I share about one of my best friends who was given a supernatural vision of Jesus. I was involved with him 20 years ago. His pastor was David Wilkerson's pastor in Tyler, Texas. His name was Wayne Snyder, probably one of the most influential men in my life when I got saved. He was the head of Maranatha, and he was, uh, you know, Maranatha was a college group, and through his ministry, we had an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. He brought David Wilkerson into Bozeman, and spending hours with David Wilkerson was kind of a blessing because you, you, you don't see uh, the true uh, measure of a man's metal, so to speak, until you not only watch him, but you hear his heart. That's through David Wilkerson. I met uh, Nikki Cruz or Angel, oh, let's see, Angel Juarez. Uh, I, met, I met about three guys that were saved, and these guys were not, let's just say this, meow men, okay? These were some of the most hardened men of their day, gangsters, gangbangers, and they came to know Jesus. It gave me such great hope. But Mark was, was younger than I was by about, I think probably, I don't know, close to uh, 10 years at least. And Mark had the most gifted, anointed time. I'm going somewhere with this. This is an important story. He had a calling on his life. God gave him a supernatural vision. He was to make a movie based on Calvin Calvin Miller's film, The Singer, Jesus, The Song, The Gospel, The Finale, The Book of Revelation. Everywhere Mark went, he absolutely had the most infectious ear-to-ear smile. And just one of those people, David, you like to be around, okay? Sure. Well, in those days, being 10 years older, I was in Dallas back and forth, you know, trying to get the movie done and, and, and getting financing, et cetera, et cetera. But a funny thing happened. This is a true story. I won't name names, but a very wealthy, wealthy millionaire. I mean, we're talking big money, hundreds of millions said, if you will but sleep with me. Sound familiar to the story you're talking about, Joseph? I'll yes. fund your movie out of my pocket. I'll write you a check for $20 million. I had met the lady. She was who he said he was. I knew the family members. You know, enough said there. He turned that down. And a little, uh, listen, and I'm not saying that was wrong. To, I'm saying it was wrong to do. But listen to how the devil trapped him. The devil brought the problem, and, and by all other people's standards, he first started hanging out with the wrong crew. This is Mark Snyder, the son of Wayne, Mil- of Wayne Snyder, who was David Wilkerson's pastor. I was kind of like the big brother. Don't go there. Don't go there, you guys. I'm telling you, don't go there, man. You can't hang around, uh, you know, uh, uh, bars and stuff and not expect it to infect you. Well, he ended up in a strip bar, and he started dating a stripper, and Next thing you know, he's married to her. Okay, now remember, this is a PK, a preacher's kid. Then the next thing after that that followed, obviously, they're married. And after that, they're divorced within probably a year or two. You can't fellowship light with darkness, and he was going to change her. All along, there's Steve and my dear friend Mary Juarez, who passed away, saying, don't do it. And she looked him in the eye in my presence and said, son, to Mark Snyder, you're not going to live very long. God didn't beat Mark up with Mary's word of knowledge, but Mark knew what she meant. Mark was my very, very uh, close friend. He he slept at my house when he was in Bozeman. He was in Dallas back and forth. We were doing pre-production stuff. And Tyler, when he was a little boy, goes up to Mark, and Tyler saw Mark uh, drinking some vodka to cover up the heroin he was using. Now you can see where I'm going with this. And Tyler said, Mark, that's not good for you. You drink too much. Don't do it. Well, little did we know that, again, probably less than three months after that, Mark hooks up with a very, very, 
and I, all I can say is a beautiful, beautiful heroin whore, okay? And I never met her. I never, because those guys, when I kept saying don't do it, they just kept doing it, and I had to pull away. I gave them, I poured my heart out, and listen, this isn't about me, it's about them. The next thing I get is a phone call. Mark's in a coma. His girlfriend shot him up. He fell in the bathroom, hit his head. He never came out of that coma. And so what I want to share to people is this. Drugs, the pharmacia that is rampant in this nation. Mystery Babylon, we are the purveyors of drugs to the world. You're seeing every nation turning against us because they see our perversion, they see our filth. And David, you and I were on a program years and years ago, and you got a better memory than anybody I know, but do you remember I said the day would come when America would drown in its own defecant? Meaning, Absolutely. you know what that. that means. The point is, and now we've got the streets of San Francisco, uh, you know, and other other democratic can, democratically controlled cities, i.e., literally, uh, Los Angeles is a good example, uh, facing new plagues, new outbreaks, and they won't do a thing to drown up, or they won't do a thing outside of maybe some small effort to take away the defecant. Now, here's what I, 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 I want to tell people this. Joe Hagan was taken captive. And if you think that, you know, well, he wasn't strong or anything, under the right conditions, any man can fail and fall. I'm not excusing his sin, and I'm certainly not excusing my sin. But I know this, that People have got to wake up because the new form of heroin will come in all the genetically modified food. It'll come in the the the, the uh, changing the chem spray in the air and stuff. And so we're being, if you will, extincted. And we're and and can I say something? Maybe we're being extincted. E x s t i n k e d. You know by our own um, waste, and as men become uh, more wicked and more wicked, the waste becomes deeper and deeper. So in essence, you know, when God takes us out of the sewer, the, the smell of fresh water, the smell of a fresh conscience, the, the, the feeling of a new heart is so amazing. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll tell you another heroin story. I knew a man who used to follow us when we had a, was a singing group in Montana called Maranatha. I didn't know this until after the fact, but he was dealing smack. He'd go into town, he'd go supposedly to the restaurant, and he'd get heroin. This was, and I'm talking 40 years ago, David. And guess what? The power of the Holy Ghost hit that guy. He went cold turkey, and he was a gymnast and an acrobat, and I literally watched this guy do backflips, and that's not an exaggeration or a metaphor. So the point that I'm trying to make is this. Those of you who are on drugs right now, and, and I want to I just share, you know, the whole situation. Look at the country now. If in the book of Revelation, I'll turn it right back over to you, David, talks about neither did mystery Babylon repent of her uh, uh, sorcery, and that word is pharmakia. Some people pronounce it pharmakia, but pharmakia, in other words, they're drugs. You know, we're, we're, we're inundated with drugs. We're drowning in our own defecant. The water we can't drink. If you drink uh, municipal water, chances are you're getting a double shot of estrogen. The men in America have been emasculated chemically and psychologically, but more so chemically. Now you have a, a, a situation that's dire where we're in the realm, an American and white America. I'm not, I'm not a, you know, ashamed to be white any more than I'd tell someone who's black or brown that you need to be ashamed. But here's the thing. Extinction is already underway, and God's people need to know that the, the Bible, and here's the, prophet, or here's the word that I don't understand, and you can elaborate on it. If God says, surely the Lord God will do nothing except he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets, and then he, God, says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, who is he talking to, David, and who are we talking to tonight? Well, he's literally talking to his people. Right. You know, but, you know it, it's a choice to listen. You know, we, we use the term, did you, we say, did you hear me? Well, it's like talking to someone at times. You heard the words, but you weren't listening to what they were saying. Revelation 2, 7, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. You've all heard me use this little statement. I don't know where I got it, where I read it, uh, or heard someone say it to me. 
I used to glean profusely from all the old preachers. I would hang around because those guys had profound wisdom and knowledge and insight. And I would gather everything I could from senior ministers. But the statement is this. Sin will take you further than you wanted to go. Sin will cost you more than you wanted to pay. And sin will keep you longer than you wanted to stay. Proverbs 27 one says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Tomorrow, we could be in a war with Iran. Tomorrow, someone listening to me today, you may be dabbling, you may be playing, you may think, oh, I'm too smart, I'm too shrewd. This won't happen to me. That's why it's called deception. Uh, you know, Steve, the, the, the message that, that Jimmy D preached in the conference was just profound about that snake, how that the woman was given the snake. She didn't want the snake, but someone in the family had died, and the snake began to get out of its glass cage. And uh, next thing she knew was in her bedroom and uh, acting lazy, uh, like it had no appetite. The next thing she knows, she wakes up in the morning, the bed, the snake is at the foot of her bed, curled up. And then the next day, the snake is in the bed, and it's up beside of her, her pillow. Then the next day, the snake is in the bed, but he's laid out long way beside of her. So she calls the veterinarian. She says, what's wrong with the snake? She went through this litany of events. He said, get the snake out of the house now. He's measuring you to consume you. We never know where Satan is setting a snare or a trap. And if you don't think Satan is trying to do that to you, you're deceived. We're told in 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. That woman was sober enough to call the veterinarian and say, hey, What's going on here? I think he's sick. He said, no. He's getting ready to ingest you. She was sober enough to find out what's going on. 2 Corinthians 2.11, Paul said, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Satan, the word ignorant there simply means you don't know. You don't understand. You don't know what's going on. And the root word there is ignored. Be careful about ignoring signs. Be careful to not ignore warnings, because Jesus told Peter in uh, Luke twenty two thirty one. He said, "Simon Peter, he said, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. When thou art converted, strengthen the brethren." Now, when he says Satan has desired to have you, the Greek says there. Satan has exceedingly demanded that I give him your soul, Peter. And when he says to sift you as sweet, the word sift means to riddle, to pierce, or to perforate. Literally punch holes into a person. Satan is your personal adversary, just like Jesus is your personal Savior. He's out to harm. The Bible says in uh, 2 Timothy 2, 25 and 26, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover or awaken themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. And that word, the phrase taken captive, it means to be taken alive. Steve alluded in the earlier part of the program, the Lord came to preach deliverance to the captives. The captives are casualties of war. And so the, the fact that we're in this profuse warfare, these are the casualties. These are the things that take place. And, you know, once an event has taken place, you can't reverse it. Steve used the analogy many times, once the bullet's fired, you can't take it back. You can't stop it. It's gone. Uh, it's going to do what it was intended to do, and if it's to hit someone and kill them, that's what it does. Well, this is Satan, and he's so subtle, 
He appears to be so benign, uh, just looking for an opportunity. That's all he wants is an opportunity. And this is why in, in our humanity we need to put ourselves on the altar of God, say, God, keep me. God, watch over me. God, protect me. Um, you know, I, I was sharing with, with, with Doug yesterday. You know, sometimes as people who have ministries, talk shows, or whatever, we never realize the gravity of the effect we have on people's lives because, you know, Steve and I do YouTube videos, we do talk shows, we do radio programs, I have my weekly programs myself, and sometimes we become complacent, uh, mundane, and we don't realize that people are listening to us for direction. So it will become somewhat casual, and of course, uh, familiarity does breed contempt. But I was, I was sharing with Doug I ask myself nearly every week, David, if you mess up, if you backslide, if you go out here into open and public sin, how is it going to affect other people? There'll be those who will say things like, I would have never believed he would have fallen. And then there'll be those who say, I knew he was a fraud all the time. You're going to get both sides of the, the, the uh, verbiage and words of whether they were really living for the Lord or not. But you see, the fact that I keep that at the forefront of my mind, what will it do to the listener if I fail? See, if, 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 if men like Jimmy Swagger, God bless his heart, he walked from the day he, he sinned with a limp, never been able to come back to the state, the place that he was. He would tell you to this day, I think Jimmy's about 83, 84, 85 years old, Jimmy, if you knew the consequences, would you have ever done that? He would tell you in a moment, never. The psalmist David, David, would you have done what you did if you had known the coming consequences? Never. Samson, would you have ever put your head in the lap of Delilah had you known the consequences? Never would I have done that, he said. I could go on. So many men. Uh, read, the, read your Bible. Godly men have miserably failed God. And it's only by the grace of God that I'm preserved, that Steve is preserved, that Doug is preserved, that others are preserved. It's by the grace of God. And, and so uh, I love Steve's analogy. I'll never forget it about putting some dirt on a, a, a saucer, a plate. And to look at that every day and say, this is who I am. This is what I am. And yet, most people uh, think more highly of themselves than they ought to think. Romans twelve three, Paul said, For I say, through the grace of God given to me, to every man that is among you, that a man ought not think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. I want you to listen to what the Apostle Paul, what he said about himself. How can he say this? He tells us how and why he's able to say this. For I say through the grace of God given to me, I understand who I am. I understand where I am. I understand the significance of God's call on my life. So I say through the grace given unto me, to all of those of you, Paul says, that are listening to me, reading my epistles, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. But think soberly, and, and, and it literally means in, in sobriety, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. And so when I look at the consequences, if I sin, if I err, what will it do to others? What will it do to my family? What will it do to my children? But see, the devil never wants you to count the cost. He never wants you to sit down and say, if I do this, that's the deception, that's the, that's the cunningness, that's the, the subtlety. Don't, don't, don't worry about the cost. Go ahead. You know? And regretfully, the more times men commit an act of sin and get by with it, then they build up a, a resistance to the conviction of God. Uh, no true Christian, when they sin, ever enjoys it because they have grieved the Holy Spirit. God gave me a little simple phrase some weeks ago as I've been teaching on the depravity of man. 
talking about Adam and Eve, when their eyes were opened, the seal was broken. What seal? Ephesians 4.30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto that day of redemption. Don't make the Holy Spirit sorrowful for how you're living. If you're really a Christian, that doesn't exempt you from falling, from sinning, and from erring. We all have done that. But we don't live a life of sin. I don't live a life of sin. I may stumble, I may fall, I may miss the mark, I may falter, but that's not how I live my daily life. I seek to live my daily life in a godly Christian way. But there are events in life. There are circumstances, you know. Uh, that's why we pray one for another. I, you know, I don't. I, I, I would be, would be a, a, a lie if I said I could handle what Doug is going through right now. You know, it, it may hit me so terribly that I say, you know what, I'm going to go get me a, a half a gallon of liquor and I'm going to I'm going to soothe my mind for a little while. You know, well, sure, that's what the devil wants you to do. And then another tragic event, another sordid accident. See. And this is why we have to keep coming to the Lord, because we never know where the pressure is going to come from. We, we don't know what vein, what avenue, what platform, but it will come. It, it will come because the devil is a thief. He's a perpetual thief. And if you're a Christian tonight and you're listening, you are under an attack. You are under an assault. And that's why we cast our cares, we cast our burdens upon the Lord. And say, Lord, sustain me, help me, keep me, watch over me. Because I know Satan is premeditating against every one of us. You know, uh, uh, yesterday, uh, and God knows my heart, I'm, I'm not going to, to share everything, uh, but Doug shared a couple things with me that were really profound. He said he, he told Renee uh, before this situation took place, he said, I, I have a bad feeling. I, I sent something, and I told him, I said, that's an unction from the Holy Spirit. And God was preparing him, letting him sense the burden, the pressure. See, Satan wants to hit you totally blindsided. He, he wants you to not know anything, to not be prepared, uh, to have no stability. He wants to knock you so hard that he destroys you. But the Spirit of the Lord had already pre preempted and prompted Doug. And he, he began internally to get prepared for this and, and, and to share it with Renee. Why? Because in his heart, he knew the enemy had thrown out a net to snare, to trap, or whatever. And you may not believe this, but that's the love of God to let us know there's something out there. What does that do? That makes you sober. But Peter said, be sober, be vigilant. Those... Uh, preemptions from God are to make us sober. I need to shake myself. I need to become sober. I need to be alert. Why? Because something is coming. I remember, and I shared this with Doug yesterday, uh, two years ago, 6 o'clock on a Saturday morning, the Spirit of God spoke to my heart and said, get up now and go upstairs and pray. And, and I came upstairs to the office. I got on my knees, and I just began to cry. I didn't know what to pray for. I didn't know how to pray, and thank God for the gift of wisdom. And I, for, for a half an hour or better, I begged God for one thing. I said, God, give me mercy. I said, God, if you will give me mercy, it doesn't matter what I'm facing. It doesn't matter what I'm fixing to encounter. If you will give me mercy, that will help me. And not knowing 14, no, nearly 24 hours from that, prayer on that Saturday morning. Linton calls me in the back of an ambulance and says, Dad, I got good news, I got bad news. The bad news is I've totaled my truck. And the good news is I'm all right. My legs hurt. I got some kids that going to put stitches in my head, but, I, but I'm fine. And they he wrapped that truck around a tree at 90 miles an hour, and they had to cut him out. And, and I wept because I said, God, you gave me mercy. Now, Linton got mercy because I was petitioning. This is why it's important to pray one for another, because your prayer may be the prayer that God answers, and God gives the person you're interceding for. You don't. You may not even know who you're interceding for, 
like me. I, di- I didn't know exactly what I was interceding for, but I said, Lord, if you'll give me mercy, mercy, if you will give me mercy, it'll be all right, because mercy, we, we have no idea of the mercy of God. We, 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 we say mercy and, oh, Lord, have mercy just in passing. We don't understand the greatness of God's mercy. Justice knocks on the door and demands justice and mercy answers, because justice says, this is what you deserve. But mercy says, I'm going to lessen it. I'm going to mitigate it. I'm, I'm going to help you. I'm going to uh, uh, be the paracletus. I'm going to give aid and comfort. And, and so when we pray, that's why we call people's names in prayer. Uh, I, I try to pray for everyone, and I ask God, bring their names to my mind that I can call their names in prayer. Because I never know tomorrow, what phone call I will get. I, regretfully, I was out of town when, when I got the phone call Saturday night from Eric. Uh, yeah, I, 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 it grieved my spirit that I was not there to intercede immediately. But God knows everyone's heart. So this is why I want to encourage you. Pray. And when the Spirit of God prompts you, and it may be a very gentle uh, 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 probing, it may be very gentle the fraud, very gentle, but respond to that. Respond and, and get on your knees because we never know. Steve brought it up in the beginning of the program, Michael and Gabriel. Gabriel told Daniel, he said, from day one that you prayed, your prayer was heard. But the prince or the demon of Persia withstood me. Lo, 20 and one day, he withstood me. The prayer was answered by God and, and the affirmation and the positive. But the battle was trying to keep Daniel from getting the answer. In other words, it's like the, somebody writing you a letter and it's in the mail, but they lose it or somebody steals it. The answer was yes or blessing or whatever. But the devil doesn't want you to get the answer. And because Daniel was persistent, he was the one actually because of his persistence kept the warfare going on in heaven until there was a victory. And he got the answer. And this is why we're told in First Thessalonians 5 and 17, pray without ceasing. You, you, you don't ever quit. You, know, you don't ever quit. And if we will be faithful followers of Christ and, and do that, we have no idea of the victories and the battles that can be won if we will stay persistent in our walk. Go ahead, Steve. Well, you know, David, as as we prayed, and Doug called me, and I, I prayed immediately. When you don't know what to say, pray. That's my new statement. Amen. And there are impossible situations now that have escalated beyond even, uh, you know, I can't say they're multiplied a thousandfold. It's it's almost like this. Equal to the evil day are the, multi, are the problems multiplying. But when you don't know what to say, pray. And I know this, so many times my wrong decisions, you know, as a poster child for wrong decisions, I'm, I'm only saying that in the light of God's grace. I say, I know what grace is. I'd better show it, too. But I think I'm reminded so many times of the fact that we don't – here's the thing. The tragedy is is that the churches – and I'm talking about the fellowships. I hate the word church. I do. You know, I know it was the first – you know, what well, called the church, was it in Corinth or whatever, or was it in Ephesus? Either one. But here's the deal. The called out ones, and what are we called out from? The world. Who are we called unto? Him, Jesus. And isn't it amazing? And I say this. You want to know, and I, I, I know this will sound simplistic, and theologians will go basically probably burn their strong concordance, but it's biblical, is that the people of God who allowed us to be shamed by the devil. I'm just going to put that out there. Who allowed us to be shamed by the devil? Who shut our mouths? Who basically took away from Jesus? Obviously, you know, the, the sower, the parable of the talents tells us that. But here is something that really needs to be uh, driven home, David. And you know it. You, you can quote it by heart. I have to read it. But Romans 8.32, 39. And some of this stuff I think people miss. And he's talking about God, okay? In verse 32, he, God, that spared not his own son, and I'm going to put in the name Jesus, but delivered him up for us all. How 
shall he not, and what does the scripture say there? How shall he not grant unto, you know, I'm sorry, I just clicked off my page, but finish that off for me, David, while I get back on there, okay? Uh, Romans 32, okay, I, I've got it. He that spared not his own, but delivered him up for us all, how, he, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And doesn't it say in the scripture that he gives us everything that pertains to life and godliness, I, 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 that our eyes would be open to life and godliness? Who shall lay any things to charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ Jesus that died. Yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, which, by the way, is starting now, and people will really see the effect of that of next year in uh, earnest, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What what is Paul is saying there is, look, we're going to be dealing with all this stuff, angels, principalities, and powers. Right now, those are invisible, but they're not going to stay invisible forever. Nor things present, nor things to come. The word of the Lord is is settled in heaven. It's going to be viewed in 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 uh, you know our lifetimes, in my opinion. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature. Hmm, a lot of strange creatures really being seen shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. But we forget the love of God, the mercy of God, it's beyond our ability to fathom. We, none of us, know the mind of God except that he, in his mercy, reveals us certain attributes of his understanding. You know, when Jimmy Deep preached that sermon at Hickory, and I would challenge, I would say this, that's probably, I went up to Pastor Langford and I said, Pastor, that's probably the best sermon, one of the top, I don't know what I said, David, three or five, but it was on, you could count it on one fan, one of the best sermons I've ever heard in my life. I've heard thousands, maybe more than that, 10,000. But what he preached was so appropriate for the time, because in essence, the devil's moving snakes in. The devil moved a two-legged snake into Joe's life. The devil moved a two-legged snake into my friend Mark uh, Snyder's life. Uh, you know, And the devil's right now, if you're sitting there with a needle in your arm, you're tying off, you know, and you're using your teeth, then I want to say this. Ask the living God now. And, and, and I, David, you know, I don't think people understand. I have watched the power of God. I really have watched the power of God. Pray a full-scale heroin addict clean instantly. I don't know why God did it in his case, and yet I know that people have to suffer and go through all this stuff. There are people that listen to you and I that have been on heroin or methadone. What was it, eight years? Did we both get the same email? Yes. Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, listen, we're, I'm excited, Pastor. You know why? Because the word of the Lord is fulfilled. He is sending you and me, thank God i got friends like you, and thank God we've got Doug Hagman, because in essence, you guys, all the listeners out there, we're able to go where airlines can't carry us, where Jeeps don't go. We're able to get the gospel out. And, and listen, it doesn't, the gospel is the good news, and I sum it up like this. No honest heart that says, help me, God, reveal Jesus to me, or help me, Jesus, if you reveal yourself to me, help me, help me, help me. And the thing is, is that God honors that prayer, because what does the scripture say? All who call, uh, all who come to me will I in no wise turn aside. Did I quote that right? Yeah. John 6, so, Yeah. So the point is, is, we're saying to you today, brethren, we're saying, Come unto Jesus. We're saying thank you for your support for Doug Hagman. I got to tell you something, you know, of the outstanding men of God, and I'm not, you know, I'm not embracing anybody's anatomy on this, but there are people that are profoundly. St- they stand out, and I'll tell you what, Doug's one of them. And he, when he had to let his son go, he did it for the sake of integrity. And the first thing I said to Pastor Langford, I said, God is going to honor that because 
Eli let Hophni and Phineas, even though he, Eli was a high priest in Hophni and Phineas, and Joe, Joe is, you know, he was a victim. He was a captive. But, you know, God is going to do something wonderful out of this. God's going to turn Doug and Renee's morning into joy. I know that. I feel that in my spirit. And so, you know, David, I want to, you know, you and I both can say this, that the word of the Lord given to both of us 20-some years ago, even before you or I were on Doug Hagman, has come to pass, and God has blessed us through Doug's obedience and a guy who said, man, I'm the last guy that should be on talk radio. Uh, I'm the last guy. And he always yields because Doug knows what he knows, but he won't go where he doesn't know. Have you noticed that too, Pastor? And I love Doug. I'm not ashamed to call him my friend, and I'm not ashamed to say, ladies and gentlemen, those of you who have been fed, those of you who have been using this fellowship as long as it can last, please support. If this is where you hear Pastor Langford, listen, I told David, I said, David, you know what I love about talking to you on the radio? I said, I get preached to and I get convicted. And, and that's serious. We all need the Word of God to wash us. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm going to just turn it over to Pastor. And, Pastor, you go ahead and close it. I mean, I'm staying with you on the radio unless you want me to come back on. But, David, you have been raised up for such a time as this. I have been raised up for such a time as this, and God wants to raise people listening to us right now that are in the gutter, that are despairing, that are committing suicide. I got an email the other day, uh, I could read it, and the guy said, hey, Steve, I'm so-and-so. I'm the guy you talked out of committing suicide. I'll tell you, my heart leapt for joy because there are people out there that are in the heights of despair. And and I want to say this. When you think that, you know, it can't get any worse than suicide, it can, going into uh, uh, eternity without Jesus. But we've got to recognize, ladies and gentlemen, that there it will never be the same again as you have known it. And I'm saying this unequivocally. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The foundations have been destroyed. Woe unto the nation that forgets God. And our nation, you can talk religious blather. You can basically have all the prayer meetings you want, and chances are some of the senators or congressmen and women attending them are satanic priests. You can go into a fellowship that won't preach Jesus, uh, crucified, resurrected, and coming again. You can listen to talk show hosts badger and beat up everybody and get so drawn away. You know, uh, listen, I'm about Jesus. God's issue with Israel, he's going to deal with it. But why waste the time knocking everything when you can be lifting up Jesus? I'm telling you point blank. We have so few hours left. This is Take this to the Lord in prayer to have the open Internet open, the closing Internet, that if you knew how precious these two hours are in the sight of God, you can only know that when you understand whoever responds to what Pastor David Langford said or I said, only as you respond will you understand in eternity how these were the two most important hours of your life. If you're coming back to Jesus, if you're giving your heart to Jesus, if you're the most flagrant backslider in the world, my crew, God sent his angels and Pastor David Langford and myself to tell you, welcome home, prodigal. The heart of God is ready to receive you. Go ahead, David. I'll let you close it. Amen. He's always willing to accept anyone that will turn from their sin. I want to say in closing today, and thank you for your love and your support for Doug and Renee during this hour. Um, there are only certain people that God can trust with this magnitude of suffering. The reason I say that is because if God allows some of us to go through the element or degree of suffering that, that uh, Doug and Joe, excuse me, Doug and Renee are going through, they may quit. They may give up, backslide, turn their backs on God. You say, how can you make that statement that God could trust Doug with that? Because he trusted Job. When the devil confronted Elohim at the throne of God in Job 1 and 6, God said, Has thou considered my servant Job? Satan did not ask Jehovah, Who is Job? His response was, Job does not serve you for naught, 
for nothing. He's only serving you because you blessed him. God knew that Job would not turn in spite of all the opposition and the magnitude of it. Because that's why the Bible starts out in Job chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job. That man was perfect, upright, one that feared God, and he shewed evil. Didn't mean that Job was perfect as we think about perfection. It meant that Job was mature, upright, he feared God, and he did his best to stay away from evil. That uh, personifies Doug Hackett. None of us are perfect, but we, we, we strive, we live to do what's right. You know, we our, our, our walk with God demands we do what's right. And as Steve said, maybe you're, you're listening tonight. The Spirit of God has touched your heart, touched your life. You're convicted. Maybe you are a backslider. Uh, we, we get emails, letters every week from people who have come back to the Lord, set free from different things. Uh, it's always amazing to hear the testimony, just like the lady whose email I read at the beginning today from Australia. The devil would never want us to understand the impact that we're having. He would, he would, he would blind the significance of what's being done by tragic events. He doesn't want us to see what God is doing. And that's why we ask you to pray uh, for the Hagman at this time and continue to do so and support them, love them. You know, don't love in word only, but in deed. You know, you know that, that was the, the, the problem there in, in 1 John chapter 3. People would say that I love you, but then they send you away hungry. Uh, I love you, but they send them away naked. I love you, but send them away thirsty. We don't, we don't do that. That's, that's hypocrisy. We, we show that by demonstrating it in some type of, uh, whether it's a monetary means or a card or whatever the case might be. Uh, this, this demonstrates the love of God. First uh, John 3, 17. But whosoever hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. It's, it's, it's cheap to say, I love you, brother. But do you pray? Do you support? Do you do the right thing? That's, that's what makes the difference. And, and again, Steve and I both are humbled that Doug has been so gracious and allowing us to share the platform that God has given him. That's love, to share. You know, most people are selfish, self-centered, self-serving. But love shares, because that's what love is. God loved us, so he shared his son, that he would give his life, that we could all have life and have it more abundantly. I want to say that tomorrow will be July the 4th. Let's remember our nation. Let's remember our president. Don't cease to pray for him. Don't quit praying. Keep praying for Donald Trump. Uh, it's a tough job to get up every day and be lied upon, castigated, encroached, impinged. You name it, they do it to the man, spitting on his children. I mean, th th this is so disgusting, what people are doing. And, again, you know, what does Eric Trump have to do with somebody in Chicago to be spit on? It, it just shows you the, the rage, and that's why... We're on the precipice of something happening. Father, I thank you for the Hagmans. I thank you for their lives. I thank you for the gifts and the talent you have bestowed upon them. I thank you, Father, for the work that they do and their heart in desiring to please you and touching the hearts and lives of many people. Father, I pray the spirit of grace and the spirit of comfort would be with them during this hour. Father, I know that you're mindful of us every day. And I love the words of David in Psalms 41, verse 11. By this, I know that thou favorest me, because my enemy doth not triumph over me. Thank you, Lord, that you don't allow the enemy to triumph over us. Yes, we may have troubles and trials and persecutions, even afflictions in our human bodies. But we thank you that you don't allow the enemy to triumph, to conquer yes, us. Lord. But, Lord, we are more than conquerors through him 
that loved us. You paid the price that we just can walk in and enjoy the blessings and enjoy the benefits of redemption and reconciliation. Now I pray for every backslider. I pray for every home, every family, every marriage, every son, every daughter, every husband, every wife, Lord. And I just pray that the spirit of peace and the bond of unity would come upon the body of Christ right now and help us all to join together in love and in unity, Lord, and do your will, whatever that might be for in this hour. Now, Father, we again thank you for Doug, the life he has lived, the life he's living to serve you and to serve your people. Bless us, keep us in the hollow of your hand, and Lord, may you always order our steps in your word that no sin, that no iniquity could ever have dominion authority, neither lordship over our lives. Don't suffer us to go into captivity, and those who are in captivity, God, break the chains and the fetters and set them free. Lord, I'm humbled that you allow us to come today, tonight, to share the scriptures and the word of God. And I pray that you will take this program, you will use it for divine edification for the entire body of your your church and minister, Father. And we'll ask you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Steve. Bye, David. All right, bye-bye.